past few weeks, our sermon series has encouraged us to find ways to connect with and serve others. This Christmas season will look very different for all of us, especially those in our church family who are older. These folks often feel disconnected from their friends and family and are in true need of encouragement. To help keep them connected, we are launching a new program this year called The Christmas Connection. To participate, simply come to this bulletin board located in the far corner of the lobby and select the card of someone who could use a little extra Christmas cheer this year. This card includes three practical ways you can connect with them, and you can feel free to come up with your own creative ideas. If you have questions about this program, please see me right here on this coming Sunday. Good morning. Welcome to MGBC. Thanks for joining us in the building. Thanks for joining us online. Please stand. We're going to read our call to worship together. You can stand at home too if you want or sit. I can't tell. But if you're, if you're here, please stand. Let's read Psalm 146 verses 1 to 2 together. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God. Today marks the first day of Advent, which means we get to sing Christmas songs. Raise your hand if you're excited. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I see that hand, Ellen. All right. Raise your hand if you're not. No, don't do that. All right, let's sing. How are you? 
I am doing great. I have a working mic. I am wide awake, unlike Nate Robinson. If you don't know who that is, he got knocked out last night, boxing match. Epic why I don't fight personally, because I feel like I would get knocked out. So I'm doing way better than Nate Robinson this Raise morning. Raise your hand if you know what Daryl's talking about. Thank oh, you, wow, thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. It's it's I'm, culturally relevant, I'm Ryan. I'm trying to affirm you, Daryl. I think you weren't. I don't, I don't think you were. I love you. <laughs> love you too. <laughs> I heard millions of dollars somewhere, so I'm gonna thumbs that up. <laughs> All right, Brian, back to you. Uh, welcome to those of you that are here this morning, and welcome to those that are watching online. Last week. We kicked off our Wheels of Joy ministry. If you would like to purchase gifts, perhaps you saw this morning some of the gifts are starting to come in, bicycles, things like that. If you would like to purchase a gift or gifts for a needy family, uh, please go to our website, mgbconline.com, and you can sign up there. Uh, you can also call the church office. If you're not computer techie, call the church office, and you can participate that way. Jason and Jen are back in the lobby this morning at the table, and so if you have questions, please stop by and see them. All right, since we know the holidays are coming quickly and uh, Christmas, it can either be a great time for some people or it can be an incredibly lonely time for some people. So to help out with this, uh, we want to encourage you to take part in our Christmas Connection Ministry. And you can do that by please taking your card out in the lobby. And Brian, uh, for people who maybe we were watching the video, but we were like, having conversations or we were you know, daydreaming about things, what is the Christmas Connection Ministry? Well, we realize this especially with this time of year and with the circumstances that our culture is going through. Uh, many people, especially our shut-ins and older folks, those at home in the village and, and locations like that, are distanced and separated from their family. So what we want to do is we want to make contact with them, either with a phone call, card, letter, note. And so what we would like you to do, if you would like to basically adopt or connect with one of those individuals, the bulletin board right outside those doors, right over there, there's some cards just grab a card, and the card is self-explanatory. It tells you what to do in order to connect with those people. All right, uh, thank you for that. So uh, please join me in prayer. Uh, dear Father, thank you uh, for this morning again. Just thank you for uh, being a God that works in our good days. And more importantly, you work in our not-so-good days as well. And I pray as we uh, get to sing songs to you, that these songs, uh, they just wouldn't be songs, but they would be prayers that we're singing to you as a congregation. Uh, we love you, and we give this prayer in your son's name. Amen. Please stand. We'll continue to sing. We're going to sing the song, What a Beautiful Name. And the two songs we're going to sing before the message aren't your traditional Christmas songs, but they talk about Christ coming to earth, the, the incarnation. And um, I just love how this first verse in What a Beautiful Name, and we can pull that up on the slides, uh, pulls from... I believe they pulled from John's gospel, which says, uh, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. And the, lyrically, we're going to sing, you were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. Um, and I love, I love how all the gospels depict uh, the, full, the full story of, of Christ coming to earth. Um, but John's is very unique in that it talks about even before he came to earth as a little baby, Jesus was the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. Jesus is God. So God comes to earth as a baby, God with us, Emmanuel. Um, it's such a beautiful picture, and I think this song just beautifully depicts that and the significance of that. He didn't just stay a little baby, uh, but he grew to be a man. He died as a sacrifice for us. He rose again and conquered death, and this song talks all about that. So let's uh, really focus in on the lyrics we're singing. Let's, let's worship together as we sing this song. Nothing compares 
child of promise, child of God, you are faithful. in the arms of love I'm alive in the arms of love I lift my hands to my God above I'm alive in the arms of love I'm alive in the arms of love I lift my hands to my God above I'm alive in the arms of love I lift my hands to my God above. I'm alive in the arms of love. You're more than enough. You are faithful. You are Savior. You are more than enough. You Father, we come before you this morning, and as we anticipate the celebration of Christmas and beginning Advent today, we celebrate the coming of the Christ child. But more than that, Father, we celebrate the coming of the King of kings and Lord of lords, one that has all things under his control, Father. So this morning, as we look into your word, I pray that you will open our hearts and our minds. If there would be someone here this morning as someone perhaps watching online that does not know you as the King of kings and Lord of lords, Father, I pray that this would be the day that you would draw them to yourself. Father, we love you. We worship you. We give this prayer in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Children, you are dismissed. We have Miss Jerry over here on your right. Miss Aaron over here on your left, and they will make sure that you get to where you need to go this morning. I trust that all of you had 
a enjoyable Thanksgiving holiday, however you celebrated it, maybe in smaller groups, larger groups, maybe through Zoom, however you did it, I pray that um, the heart of Thanksgiving uh, was not lost this past week. Christmas is a special day for children, but it is a special day for those that are only children. I was an only child. Perhaps that answers some things with respect to uh, myself. But um, while there are good points and bad points to being an only child, when it comes to Christmas, it's an awesome thing. Because you have no one to share the spoil with on Christmas morning. There's no one else there that you need to divide the gifts. Uh, My mom and dad, obviously, as being an only child, they had some friends. And the most awesome thing about those friends were Fred and Ruth Klein and Dot and Jim Mills did not have any children either. So I took it upon myself to help them experience what the true spirit of giving is all about. And so when we would get together, the seven of us, for the holiday, I kind of became their son for that Christmas day. So needless to say, I look forward to Christmas not only for the gifts that my parents would give, but from their friends that had no children as well. I would set my sights after Thanksgiving on the Christmas holiday. Now, my parents had explained to me, as well as going to church, what the true meaning of Christmas was. And it would start off well, but as I got closer and closer to the holiday and started to look forward to those gifts and presents, I had a tendency to lose my focus and get lost to the true meaning of Christmas in all of the excitement as a child. Today is the first day of Advent. Advent means coming. It's that period between Thanksgiving and Christmas in which we anticipate the celebration of the coming of Christ. Each of those days of Advent, those Sundays, has a particular theme. Uh, Today's theme, the first Sunday of Advent in which we've lit this candle, is the theme of hope. Someone posted online this week that they're going to be sure to stay up on New Year's Eve this year, not so much to welcome 2021, but to make sure that 2020 leaves. As we have said over the recent months, as we've gone through this together collectively, God is in control Nothing catches him by surprise. There's nothing that happens in our world and in our culture and in our lives that happens by circumstance. Nothing takes him off guard. It is not random to God. He always has a strategy. He always has a plan. And that plan and strategy in Scripture is revealed through prophecy. Now today... We are going to begin a new series, The Coming King, and we're going to look at the prophecies of Jesus Christ. One-fourth of the Old Testament, approximately, are prophetic scriptures. They are written about future things that are to occur. And when we see those prophecies written, and then we see the fulfillment of those prophecies, we come to the stark realization that God does have a plan. We see this prophetic scripture all the way back in Genesis. At the sin of Adam and Eve, we see one of the first prophetic scriptures there in Genesis chapter 3. Because of Satan's involvement, Satan's work in the fall of man, God pronounces a prophetic judgment upon Satan there. With this pronouncement, with this prophetic judgment, with this prophetic utterance by God upon Satan in the garden, we see a glimpse of his future plan. That nothing catches God off guard. Nothing happens by random chance with God. And in this prophetic announcement, we see the plan of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Remember now that God is speaking to Satan. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between you and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The idea of enmity here literally means war. There's going to be a war. And the war is going to be between your offspring, Satan, and her offspring. Now, when we speak of the offspring here of Satan, we talk about Satan, his demons, and those that seek to do evil. When we speak of her offspring, the offspring of a woman, we look at all of mankind. And out of that, the Savior, ultimately, Jesus Christ. The battle, the war that will take place, eventually will come to a conclusion, will come to a head at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It says, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. What he's speaking of here is the crucifixion, that Jesus Christ will crush, the NIV says, crush the head of Satan. You, yes, Satan, will bruise his heel. God, simply out of love for us, no other explanation but his great love for us, begins to put together the plan of salvation, to redeem us, to get us free from our sin and our guilt. But God being holy, he simply cannot look past our sin or ignore it as it never occurred. In fact, a few verses later, he tells Adam and Eve that they will return to dust, that the punishment for their sin, their disobedience, is death. And then a few verses later in verse 21, we see Adam and Eve are naked, and God comes to them after slaying an animal. Death, shedding of blood, covers them with the skins of the animal. There's a tension here, though. Think about it. God seeks to redeem us, to bless us with his love and relationship, but at the same time, he must judge us of our sin that is punishable by death. David Platt calls this the great riddle of the Old Testament. How can God bless us, love us, provide us with relationship, yet also pass judgment upon us that is deserving of death? Moses would write about this in Exodus chapter 34 in verses 6 and 7. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. We have a God that desires to bless us and is abounding in steadfast love, but he simply cannot look past our sin. Blessing and judgment. Blessing and judgment. Keep those themes in your mind this morning as we move through these passages of Scripture. God is loving and compassionate, full of grace and mercy, but sin must be judged and punished with death. We see this all through the Old Testament with the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel would obey God. They would follow God. They will follow his laws, and God would bless them. Then they would turn to false gods. They would pull away from him. They would go their own way and not follow his law, and then he would judge them. Generally, he would judge them with slavery or exile or some other means, but he would bless them as long as they followed, and then when they pulled away from him, he would give them his judgment. Oftentimes, when they were in exile, God would send a man to to come to them, to lead them back to righteousness, to, to bring them back to the blessing of God, only to see them chase after false idols again. 
and to lose the blessing of God and fall under his judgment. In one of these periods of exile, God would send a man by the name of Isaiah. Isaiah means the Lord saves. And Isaiah would give the nation of Israel hope in the midst of their difficult time. In the midst of their exile and their slavery, Isaiah would give them hope. How would he do that? He would remind them of the offspring of the woman. He would remind them of the Genesis 3 passage that we looked at. That there would come one that would save us. There would come a child that would save us. He would be our Messiah. He would be our King. Now remember, the passages that we're about to see and read were written 700 years prior to the birth of Jesus Christ. Look at Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. He will give you a sign. God says, I have a plan. Don't lose hope. I'm going to give you a sign. I'm going to give you a sign not to lose hope, to hang in there, that the virgin will conceive, that there will be a son that will be born. A child will be born to this woman, and she shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us, literally, With us, God. With us, God. Look at Isaiah chapter 9, a few chapters later. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. To whom is this child brought into the world? To us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And this child will grow to take the government. He'll have leadership. He'll have authority. He'll have power. He will rescue the nation of Israel from their oppression. The child is born to bless the world. Notice how Isaiah writes, he will give you a sign. It will be literally God with us. To, you, to us a child is born. To us a son is given. This is the blessing of God. But in Isaiah chapter 53, we see a different, we see a change. One of the most significant passages of Scripture refers to the suffering servant. You see, in Isaiah 53, the blessing turns to judgment. The blessing of God turns to judgment. But don't miss this. In Isaiah 53, the judgment doesn't fall upon the people. The judgment falls upon the promised son that was just discussed with them. The judgment will fall upon the Messiah. The judgment will fall upon this anticipated child of the virgin. The one that is born to us to bless us and gift us. The judgment of God will fall upon this child. Make no mistake, Isaiah 53 is speaking of Jesus Christ, the judgment of God that will be brought upon Christ. Look at Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. Surely this Christ child, Jesus Christ, would bear our griefs and carry our sorrows. The passage says that we esteemed him stricken. Basically, when they looked at Christ on the cross at that time... Many people said, see, that's what you get. That's what you deserve. That God is stricken and God is punishing you right now because this is what you deserve. But he was pierced, literally, means to bore through his hands, his feet, the spear into his side, the thorns upon his brow. He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our sins, Upon him was the punishment that brought us peace. 
all of this that occurred, the wounds that Jesus Christ uh, assumed, that, they, that, that he took on, the piercings that Jesus Christ endured, they were not simply aspects of torture. They had a purpose. They had a meaning. They had results behind them. Yes, peace between the holy God and man would be achieved. With his wounds we are healed. The chastisement that brought us peace. Take a look at 53 verse 6. Isaiah 53 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You see, this includes everyone. The death of Jesus Christ involves all of us because none of us escapes sin. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. We all, at some point, have turned to our own way. And the Lord God has laid on Jesus Christ, His Son, the Messiah, the iniquity, the sin, the punishment of us all. What we see here is total depravity. Nobody escapes. We're all sinful people. And we see substitutionary atonement because God put that punishment on Jesus Christ. Look at Isaiah 53, 10. I've divided this passage, this verse, into two parts for a very particular reason. You'll see why in a minute. Isaiah 53, 10, the first part. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. Don't miss this. The will of the Lord to crush him literally means that God was pleased to punish and crush his own son. Do you feel and sense the love of the Heavenly Father that he would do that to his own son? For you, for me. The Lord was pleased to crush him, pleased to put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. The Jewish people would completely understand that. They knew the sacrificial system and what that all involved. That they would sacrifice the animal in order to satisfy as a guilt offering for the people. But notice here, in the second part, there's a little bit of a transition. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. That's resurrection. That's resurrection. Jesus will see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. Jesus would see his followers, his disciples. He would resurrect from the grave. He would see you coming to faith and understanding in Jesus Christ. He would see the children of God. God would prolong his days by resurrecting him from the grave. There's a purpose behind prophecy in Scripture. First of all, prophecy ensures the reliability of God. You can count on it. When God says that he's going to do something, he will do it. And all you have to do is look at all the prophetic utterances of Scriptures that have been fulfilled, and you see how God has fulfilled all of those aspects of his prophetic words. The birth of Jesus Christ, his son, in Bethlehem, prophesied in Scripture. When Jesus comes into Jerusalem riding on a colt, that's prophesied in Scripture. When, when the people come out and say, our King, Jesus Christ, there's our King, it's prophesied in Scripture. The fact that Jesus was crucified between two criminals is prophesied in Scripture. Prophecy is also intended to bring us hope. Those that we have looked at this morning were to give hope to the nation of Israel. They were in difficult circumstances, in trying times. They were in exile and slavery. And Isaiah comes to them, and other prophets come and say, Listen, have hope. Messiah is coming. God will complete his plan. There are some prophecies, though, from Scripture that have yet to be fulfilled. These 
future prophecies, those yet to come, also fill us with hope. One of which is the second coming of the King, the second coming of Jesus Christ. Daniel, Micah, Zechariah, all speak of this, the second coming of Jesus Christ. Yes, the first time he came as a baby, as a child, but the second time he will come, he will come as King of kings and Lord of lords, and we are to have hope and anticipate and look forward to that. Two angels give a prophetic announcement of this. Remember when Jesus and the disciples are gathered together and Jesus is going to ascend into heaven, the disciples ask him, Jesus, are you now going to restore the kingdom, restore the nation of Israel to power? Jesus says, it's not time for you to know, nor you, do you need to know when that will occur. What you need to know is that you need to go and you need to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news throughout the world. Jesus then ascends into heaven and the two angels that are there, are, it's written, and while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men, two angels stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. John would also write in the book of the Revelation that Jesus is going to come again. And the second time that he comes as king, he will set up his eternal kingdom. In Revelation 21, verses 3 through 4, it reads this, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, Emmanuel, God with us, the first time as a baby coming as the God-man. The second time he comes, he will come as king and dwell with them. And they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall be any mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Praise God, we look forward to that hope, that God has a plan. Now, if he fulfilled the first prophecy of the coming of the child, you can bet that God is going to keep his word and he's going to come again. Look forward to it. Have hope in it. Anticipate it. And prepare for it. I told you when we started that I was an only child. Prior to my arrival, my mom had conceived three other children. For whatever reason, God chose to take those three to be with him as opposed to me having brothers and sisters. This was devastating to my parents. It was a very difficult time in their lives over those several years that they anticipated the coming of a child only to not be able to hold that child. In fact, one of the children was actually alive and was born for a day or so before it passed away. But my mom and dad continued to have hope. Hope that one day they would have a child. They continued to prepare. They continued to hold on to hope. They continued to look forward to that day of blessing when one day God would bless them with a baby and bring joy into their lives. The Christ child, God with us, has already come. He has been here. He came. He was prophesied. He blessed us. Emmanuel, God with us. And he gave his life to pay for our sin. But the prophecy of the second coming, the king, is yet to be fulfilled. We look forward to that second coming when he comes not as a baby, as I said, but as a king with power and glory and authority. But he will also come to judge the world of its sin and to set up his kingdom and his reign forever. We began 2020 with the sermon series from Matthew 5 on the Sermon on the Mount. And you remember in the Sermon on the Mount, as we talked about 
Jesus tells us what the kingdom is to look like and the people that are in the kingdom, how are they to live and how are they to interact with other, other individuals and what it means to be in the kingdom of God. I ask you this question. Are you a citizen of the kingdom? Are you a citizen of the kingdom of God? Have you acknowledged your sin? Have you repented and turned from that sin? Have you come to the realization that because of your sin, you need a Savior, one that has borne all of the iniquities, all of the sin of all of the world in His body through His death, burial, and resurrection? Have you put your trust in the work of Jesus Christ on the cross that day? Listen, if you have not done so, I would encourage you, please talk with Daryl, talk to myself, talk to one of the elders. If you're watching online, call the office. We'll meet with you. But if you have not given your life to Jesus Christ, if you have not accepted him as Lord of your life, and you're outside the kingdom, we encourage you to consider giving your life to him and coming in this morning. Take heart. Be full of hope. God is in control. Nothing catches him by surprise. All of this that we're experiencing today, God knew it was all coming. He has a plan prepared to deal with all of it. Just as we saw, his plan has been prophesied in Scripture and it has been fulfilled. Yes, there is some yet to come and we anticipate that. We look forward to that and we prepare for it. Jesus, the King, is coming. Join me as the praise team comes back to the stage and let us pray. <clears throat> Father God, we anticipate your second coming. We thank you and praise you for the plan that you put together before the foundation of the world. And we see it in Genesis 3 that from a woman, a child would be conceived and you have blessed us with our Savior, Jesus Christ. But we are also a people of sin and we deserve judgment and death. Thank you, Father, for the plan of the gospel, the plan of salvation in which your son, you were pleased to crush your own son out of your love for us. We have a king who left his throne on high and walked the earth with open arms and gave his life and died. You are the God that mends broken hearts. The restless soul can find peace in you. You are the king of glory. You will never let us go, Father. We pray that we will hold on to that hope, that we will prepare for that second coming. We anticipate it, we long for it, and we look for it. We give this prayer in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our King. Amen. Please stand.
coming to this earth to provide us a way of salvation, and I pray that if there's anyone here, anyone watching online that doesn't know you, uh, that they take the next step to knowing about you, that they talk to somebody, that they've come to saving faith in you. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.